welcome to the replay. I'm Jason Butler and on tonight's live I'm going to be talking about wealth building tactics. Just some ideas and thoughts. It's not one of those get rich quick ideas. I'm, I can't promise and wave a magic wand but what I can do is just share with you some tactics and these are tactics things you can do. It's down to you to decide whether you're going to um, follow them up, if you're gonna, if they're right for you. I'm not here to give you personal advice. Um, what's right for you will depend on your preferences, your circumstances, your mindset, uh, and your priorities. So please don't take anything I say as advice. I always say that at the beginning. If you're in any doubt, get advice from a professional advisor, tax advisor, accountant, financial advisor, financial planner, even a money coach can, can help you. So to, tonight I'm gonna be talking, as I say, about tactics on wealth creation. Um, so if you're not in the wealth creation phase of your life, then don't worry, it's not a problem. Um, you might know people who are. But if most, most people who follow me do tend to want to have a bit more money, a bit more income, a bit more wealth, a bit more options, then I just want to share with you just some insights, including two or three things that are quite new. Uh, they're not uh, way out there, and I'm not going to be talking about crypto tonight. Uh, one is because I'm not an expert on crypto. I'm aware of what it is. I have a little bit of crypto um, just for research purposes. Um, there are people who are more interesting and more uh, knowledgeable in that area than me. And in fact, uh, tomorrow night, so, sorry, tomorrow's podcast is with a very interesting guy who is apparently all in on crypto. So if you're interested in hearing about how you can make passive income on crypto portfolios, then that might be worth listening to. And you can find out about that, that guy's particular approach on it. So that's tomorrow on the Real Money Stories podcast, which is out tomorrow. So yeah, let's crack on. First of all, before we talk about uh, some of the tactics, and it's just a quick uh, whistle stop tour on some tactics, I want to talk about mindset, because I think this is something which isn't spoken about enough, really. And if it is spoken about, it's, it's by people who haven't got experience. And I don't mean to knock anyone who's younger on Instagram or on YouTube, but I'm 52 and I've been around a bit. So I've seen a bit of life and, and I've, uh, I've done a lot of research and I've had a lot of experience of life as well. So I can give you my thoughts on it. Money is merely a tool, right? OK, it's not the be all and end all. If you haven't got much of it or you've got loads of it, it doesn't define you as a human being. It doesn't mean if you've got loads of money, you're super smart and wonderful and hardworking. And it doesn't mean also if you don't have much money or somehow you've had mistakes or failures, that somehow you are a lesser person. We are all equal um, as human beings. We all come in with nothing and we all go out with nothing. And the only difference is what we do in that bit in the middle. But the reality for most people is if we can avoid being in poverty, uh, and I do know people who are in poverty who seem perfectly happy, but if we can avoid being in abject poverty and we can have choices as to how we spend our time and who we spend our time with and what we do, uh, and generally speaking, that would be a good state for most people to be in, right? Most people would agree that if they are not worrying about where the last penny is coming from and they've got the choice as to what they do with their time, then that's, that's the richest person in the world. And you can do that on not huge amounts of money because it's never about what you earn. It's always about what you spend. And it's always about what you keep and what you choose to not spend today. So that's it. That's it. Wealth creation is really simple. Make sure you've got more coming in than is going out on daily consumption, that you're doing wise things with the difference, okay? And that you also, the way you do spend your money, you spend it in areas that give you the most fulfillment, the most contentment, and the most meaning uh, for your existence. That's it, right? So that's it. End of the live. All finished. No, I'm joking. So um, let's just run through. So I'm going to run through today um, just some ideas here for you to think about. This is just a whistle stop tour for you to then go and decide whether this is right for you or whether you need to do more research or whether you need to take advice um, just to get your creative juices flowing. Some stuff is conventional, but there is some new stuff in tonight's live, which I'll be sharing with you, which uh, I think is quite exciting. And I'm going to share a couple of stories as well of things I've been doing over the last couple of weeks, because there's always something going on where I'm earning money, where I'm doing a deal, or I'm learning something, or, or I'm doing something new, okay? And I just want to share that with you. Okay, so let's have a look then. So mindset, um, we've got to be worthy um, to have money come to us. In other words, we've got to feel that we are worthy to have abundance, choice, wealth, options. And that doesn't mean to say we feel entitled. Entitled is different. Worthy means that I'm, you know, why, if, if not me, who, who? Why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I have options? And it's a really interesting thing is that when you start to think, if you start thinking like a wealthy person, and I don't mean going out buying Bentleys on finance. What I mean is when you start thinking about a wealthy person, you just think, well, I am a wealthy person. Um, and what do, how do wealthy people think? And it's relative, but the key point here is to start thinking differently and to believe that money will come to you if you are 
respectful to it, but not obsessed by it. If you look for opportunities, if you're trying to grow, and if you are genuinely prepared to put time and effort into learning um, what successful people do, financially successful people do, but also um, get that story in your mind right. So my new book that's coming out at the end of the year, I spend a lot of time talking about your story, your money story, where you've come from, what you believe is true. There's an interesting take on this. Um, one of the researchers that I drew from in the book was that she says that we all have this story in our mind, okay? But the story is just your perspective. If, if five of us all sat and watched a film, we would all see different aspects of that story. There might be the broad story could be the same, but we would all see it differently and we would all recount it differently. So therefore, what you're telling yourself about money, the role of money in your life and the ability for you to get it or not get it or how successful you've been is really about the story that you're telling yourself. And sometimes that story needs updating, it needs refreshing, sometimes it needs completely replacing, right? So that's mindset. Um, I can't spend much more on that, but let's just run through some things that you could do to help you improve your financial position and build wealth. Now notice I talk about build wealth. I'm not talking about consumption. Building wealth is different from consuming. So let's run through these. Right, so quick, simple ones. If you're employed, salary or bonus sacrifice in lieu of pension contributions and get your employer to add the employer's national insurance. So if your employer pays you a thousand pounds salary or bonus, they have to pay 138 pounds employer's national insurance. And you obviously pay basic rate, high rate or additional rate tax on that. But if they put it in your pension, that thousand pounds, your personal pension, you can put up to 40,000 pounds a year into a personal pension or an occupational scheme. Um, and uh, you can go back to the last three years if you haven't utilized those, then they don't pay the employer's national insurance. So what they can do is, is put that on as an additional contribution for you. So that 1,000 pound becomes 1,138 pounds. It's a real simple one. So if you've got a bonus due to you, make sure that you, if you could afford to, that, you know, just disclaim it if it makes sense for you by doing bonus sacrifice for your pension and getting your employers to add national insurance. So say you've got a 3,000 pound bonus. I mean, that's like nearly 500 quid, 500 pound extra money for nothing. So simple things, as well as the tax relief, get your employer to add the national insurance. So that's just a simple one. Right, another one, how about this then? Um, if you've got a mortgage, why don't you look at remortgaging? Now, I'm not talking about increasing the amount you're borrowing, but the rates now are so low, and even if you're in a fixed rate deal or a discounted deal and there's an early redemption penalty, it might still be better for you to remortgage because you can get a five-year fixed rate borrowing if you uh, have got a high credit rating and 40% deposit for 1%. 1% fixed for five years. I just can't see that that's gonna continue forever. So if you are currently paying 2%, and you're, you've built equity, your property's gone up, or you might be able to get your mortgage down a bit, that could be worth doing. And here's the thing, the saving, you don't necessarily need to pile it into paying the mortgage down, okay? Unless, of course, you've got other debts that are non-mortgage, but you could start investing that money. You could start investing it in an index fund, or you could start building up more of a safe, uh, savings pot. You could start buying a bit of crypto. I'm not saying do it, but I'm just saying, you could start to buy assets. You could start building up some money, a deposit for an investment property. So. The thing about that is that's just a simple one. That's just lowering the cost of your existing mortgage, okay? So look at that, that's really worth doing. And if you can save money on the mortgage, that's money that you can either plow into investments, build up savings, um, uh, and invest there, they're on. Now, how about, how about this then? If you've got a spare room, right, in your house, or you could turn a room that you're not using into a bedroom, you could rent that out as the rent a room allowance, and you don't pay any tax on that up to seven and a half thousand pounds. So that's a rent-a-room allowance. Now, what about, and I'm not saying you do this just for the rent-a-room, but you, that you were to move home and buy a house that had an extra bedroom more than you needed, and then you rent it out under the rent-a-room allowance, you could get up to seven and a half thousand pounds from someone to rent that room. So think about it. It can make sense sometimes to move, buy a bigger house, perhaps a little slightly bigger mortgage, on with the view that particularly with some houses you can have it in such a way with a bedroom it's still part of the main house but it's kind of might be tucked around the corner it could be in a garage extension which has been converted or it could be a garage that could be converted obviously to be habitable so think about that does it make sense to move to be able to rent one of your rooms out and a room can be still attached to the house but could be kind of separate right so just think that one through so could you convert your existing home or could you move home with a view to either creating a room from nothing or using a room um, and it might not necessarily be right in your face. It may not be feasible for you if you're in London, you're in a small flat, but uh, just think about that one. Is that something worth doing? Could you move to a different area? 
Um, so that's a good one, rent a room, tax free, and it's about sweating the existing assets you've got. And in fact, you can probably find that your lodger could pay for the vast bulk of your mortgage. Uh, obviously, you've got to be careful who you have in, and it will be a license that you give them, not a tenancy agreement. What about um, outbuildings? Now, you, a lot of people need places to work, right? Um, they don't always want to work in their home, which is not feasible. So you might have an outbuilding which you could convert. And uh, I think Jazz Rose actually did this recently. He's got a garage or something or an old shed that he reconverted to actually be um, really nice insulated space. And he rents that out as an office. It cost him 20,000 quid, I think, to do it up. And he, I think he rents it out for something like 6,000, 7,000 pound a year. Now, what an amazing return. That was just sitting under his nose. So is there some... Is there a space where you're living uh, which you could convert? Or have a look around you. Are there places that you could go and rent business units and then let out to other people, obviously with the landlord's permission? So you could rent to rent. You could do that with a home, couldn't you? You could go and rent someone else's home and then rent it out to someone else. That's called rent to rent. And you can make a margin. You've become like a sort of letting agent, but it's possible, right? So you don't take any financial risk. You just go out rent someone's home, add some value to it up, make it look nice, perhaps put some cheap secondhand furniture on and a few bits from Ikea, and then you rent it out to someone, you make it desirable, and you rent it out to them um, and take a margin. So that's another way of making money. I'm not saying do this, I'm just saying these are suggestions, okay? So that's called rent to rent. Um, also, um, think about pay rise or a bonus. Now, if you're employed, it's not for your employer to rush up and say, oh, I think you're due for a nice pay rise, and we really think you should have a bonus. It's down to you to make sure that they're aware of your value, right? Now, look, the labour market at the moment is absolutely as tight as anything, right? Uh, 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 give us a thumbs up if you, if you are aware how, how many vacancies there are and that the labour market is very much a, uh, basically a seller's market. So if you're selling your labour, if you're selling yourself uh, for a job or a position or a role, um, actually wages are going through the roof on everything from HGV drivers to plumbers to creatives to marketing people to dev people to tech people. You cannot find good stuff for love nor money. Now this is good, right? This is good because what it will do is it will mean that wages will have to rise because they've been artificially low, haven't they? We've had asset prices rising and you always find this with economics. Everything is self-leveling. Essentially, wages need to go up a good fair bit in order for people to be able to afford to live where they're living and support their lives and be able to also save. So this is natural and we want this to happen and we can't just keep importing cheap people from Eastern Europe and all that stuff, that's all finished that thing. So what we're now having to do is we're gonna to have to say to our employers, if we are employed, is look, um, here's where I'm adding loads of value. This is the going market rate for the job and a lot of employers are not aware that rates have gone up. So here's the thing, if you've got an existing job, you're working full-time, part-time for someone else, it's your job to lay the ground and do it in a sensible, non-confrontational way to lay the ground for a bonus and or a salary increase. And it may be that what you're doing is you're laying the ground for that bonus or salary increase a few months down the line, right? Because it'd take you that time to find a new job anyway. So here's what I would do, I would be laying the ground for, um, a, if you're genuinely good at what you do, and uh, you could get another job, uh, start looking around, look at the value you're delivering and start laying the ground for pay rises, share options, uh, extra pension contributions, uh, private health insurance, whatever you want, um, bonus, whatever you think is appropriate to you, more time off, more flexi time, working from home all the time, whatever it is you want, start laying the ground for it. And what you want to do is get the employer to realize, one, that you're valuable, two, that they want to keep you, Three, that they realise the labour market has changed. And this is the point. In the last year, uh, the demand for labour has gone through the roof on every level. So employers are trying, they're, they're, they're playing catch up. Your job is not to play catch up. Your job is to help them pay you the most that they possibly can for the value that you're creating. So if you like that, give me a thumbs up. Uh, that's just a simple one for free one. So you're laying the ground for you to get paid more if you're delivering value. Bearing in mind it's a tight labour market and employers need to be educated with that in a subtle way. And if at the end of the day they don't play ball in two, three months time, then you need to basically have that plan B. A plan B which is, uh, I'm giving notice, thank you. Sorry you couldn't you know, deliver what I needed, but um, there's a new opportunity here. And here's the thing, it might give you an opportunity. There's plenty of ways of raising your wages. Just start looking about. I'm not saying change your job if you love it and you love the people and it suits you, but just start looking about, you'd be surprised. Wages are going through the roof. You're welcome. Uh, okay, so 
Now, help to build. Give us a thumbs up, or give me a, give me a that if you've heard of the new help to build scheme, right? Help to build, the help to build scheme. So you've probably heard of help to buy, which is where the government are helping all the developer friends sell people substandard homes, brand new homes, right? Which are 15 to 20% over market price, okay? And the government takes, gives a 20% loan, you put 5% and the rest is done by a mortgage company. That's called help to buy. That's when you're paying over the odds for a new property and the government's helping you buy it, okay? Not something I recommend, right? Do not recommend help to buy. It is an absolute bugger's medal because the property values within, you know, as soon as you bought them, they are worth 15 to 20% less. And if you don't believe me, do a Google search, House of Commons, library paper, help to buy scheme. And it's there in black and white, 15% premium. You're paying over the odds. Now, help to build is this idea that they're saying, okay, well, what if people want to build a home, their own home or have it built for them? or go to a syndicate where they're being built for people who want to specify kind of the last 10, 15%. Well, help to build is this idea that's saying, okay, well, it's all very well be, you've been given a rabbit hutch which is overcharged, but you see, help when you build your own home, if you're a self-build, what you're doing is you're buying the land or somebody's selling you the land, then you are having the build costs. And what you end up with is you've paid for the cost of the land and the actual building of it, but you're not paying this big premium which goes to the developer. So therefore your property should be worth more than you've paid for it pretty much from day one, okay? Because there's an uplift value for when you've got the land, you've built the house, like my Woodcutter's Lodge. So my Woodcutter's Lodge cost me about 220,000 quid to build it. It's worth 400,000 now. Uh, I own the land already, but even if I bought the land, the land would have been about 150, 160. It still has a, a premium of 20, 30 grand premium over the cost of the land and the build, okay? Obviously, I spent a bit more than you would normally because I want to do a high quality job because it's, it's next to my house. So, um, help to build is a scheme which is coming out very shortly. It's going to, the details are going to be announced in September. And we think it's going to be like help to buy, but basically the government will lend up to 20%. A lender will end up to 75%, and you need to come up with 5%, but it's done in stages. So you buy the land, then it's you know coming out the ground, then it's finishing off practical completion. So it's done in three stages. If you want to find out about that, then you should register with the self-build portal, and I'll make sure that there's links available tomorrow in my new blog, um, which in fact, I'll be giving you all the links to this stuff. But if you can search now, you can put self-build portal and you can register with your local council to say that you're interested in a self-built or custom-built house. It doesn't commit you to having to do it, but what they do is they have to keep you informed if there are pieces of land becoming available, uh, when their new help to build schemes comes out, they'll have to tell you about it, and the help to build portal will be telling everyone who's registered about the scheme when it comes out. And I'm not saying it is right for everyone, I'm not saying it's right for you now, but it might be right for one of your friends, or it could be right for you next year. So have a look at that, help to build, really worth looking at. You know I love the idea of building your house because I've built one. It's great fun. Um, and I've previously told you about the House Build, House Builders Bible by Mark Brinkley. He was on the podcast um, a couple of months ago. Brilliant book. And it would demystify it all. And even if you don't want a project manager, you can find someone or you can find a scheme where there's 10, 15 or 20 houses being built and you can be part of that. So that's the help to build scheme. Uh, well worth looking at. Now, the next one is I've alluded to this in a couple of podcasts ago about converting your loft, right? So everyone within reason, if you're not in a listed property and you're not in a conservation area, most people have what we call permitted development rights. So most householders, whether you're in a, uh, you know, a small tiny terraced house or a great big mansion, most of us have permitted building rights unless they've been taken away or we're in a listed building or we're in a conservation area. And what this means is there are things we can do to our house where we don't have to get permission from the local authority. We tell them we're doing it, of course, and they confirm it's okay that it is permitted building rights, and then we can do it. But as well as doing a loft conversion, what people don't realize is that the rules have changed over the last year or so, and particularly uh, there's been some changes this month. But the for householders, if you own a house, the big change is that you can put, if you have a single story bungalow, you can put one story, okay, plus you can convert your loft. If you've got a two story house, you can put two stories plus convert your loft. Right, And you can also extend backwards and sideways. Now there are some caveats to this about the size and the length and the height and stuff, but it's, it's amazing what you can do. And so it means that you don't have to get planning permission. 
Um, and you can actually extend your footprint. You can make your house more uh, sizable. I mean, you, you might have a house that you could actually turn into flats, right? Sell the two flats off and move out and be mortgage free. So start thinking about this. Start thinking about this. Could you make your existing house worth more money and then cash out of it and be mortgage free? Now that's a thought, right? Now I'm not saying that this is right for everyone to then suddenly convert a property into flats, but if you make it bigger, then you would need to get permission to get it converted into two separate flats. That's a separate issue. But if it's big enough, because you've extended it under permitted building rights, then there's a good chance you can turn a very large property into two flats or even three flats. So that's just a thought, right? Um, so that's the thing to think of. Permitted uh, development rights, well worth doing. Now, another thing, you could buy a classic car. Um, who likes cars? Anyone like cars? Give us a thumbs up if you like, if you're a petrol head. Let's see who we've got on the thing here. Let's have a look here. Who we've got on the call. I'm just gonna have a quick look at some of the comments. Here we go. Oh yeah, hi Peter, hi John Quill. Uh, Donna, good to see you. Yeah, let's have a look. Um, can you use help to build, to build an extension? Uh, no, Peter, this is for complete new build dwellings, so it has to be complete new. It can be a brownfield site, um, and you could have demolished your existing house. We're still waiting for the exact details because they're coming out any day now, early September, but it is for new build. It's not for putting an extension on the back of your house. Um, now, that would, be a, that would be a great idea, wouldn't it? I think the money would run out in about a minute. Um, so, yeah. Okay, good. So um, let's have a look at a couple of other things then. Um, yeah, classic car. Now I'm not I'm not a keen I'm not a keen sort of car person as you know, um, but there is something to be said if you have storage space and you do like cars, then you if you can spot what's going to be the next best thing. Uh, I mean I think S L Mercs from the eighties. I think you can still pick those up for twenty five, twenty six grand. They could be worth fifty grand. Now I'm not saying bet the farm on this. I'm not saying this is a retirement strategy, but if you're interested in it then spotting that next classic car could be the way forward. Could be could be of interest to you, specifically if you like cars. So just think that one through. Um, I don't, as I say, I'm not going to talk about crypto because it's not something I want to recommend as an investment class. It's, it's, we don't even know if it is an asset class. What we do know is it's something which, if everyone believes in it, um, then it has a value, okay? Um, but at the moment, the jury's out. It's very volatile. It, I would be going to that sort of thing last. I wouldn't be using, that's a bit like gambling because we don't know if it's going to work. It might well do and we could all miss out, but it's not something I think that we we can look to the past and say, yes, it has always worked. Uh, if you fancy getting into some of that, fair enough. Create some, do it monthly because monthly will mean if it's volatile and going up and down, you'll be gradually easing into it as opposed to putting all your money in in one go. But I don't know enough about crypto to recommend that. But the podcast tomorrow night, uh, coming out tomorrow, is with a guy who reckons, you know, he, he thinks crypto is the answer to everyone's problems. And he also talks about how you can make a passive income, like an income where you haven't got to work for it, off of crypto. So that's an interesting one, uh, worth listening to that guy. He's a guy from the States. Um, quite an interesting guy. Okay, um, now, rent and invest. So here's a thought. Now, Remy Sethi, who's a, a bit of an American guru on money, a bit like a young Indian version of Dave Ramsey without the, the tub thumping and the guns. Um, he, um, he's a very big uh, proponent of this idea of renting, out, renting your home in a place that you want to live and then investing in property. Okay, now that can make sense. So if you own a house, you could sell it and release the capital. Or if you've got a deposit for a house, instead of buying a house, you could still rent and go and buy an investment property. Obviously there are risks with everything. You can have, the tenant might not pay. You might make a mistake on the purchase price. You might not be able to get the borrowing or the rates may go up. There's always risks in everything, but that is a genuine strategy. So rather than owning your house, renting your house means you're also outsourcing all the maintenance problems, all the upkeep problems, all the repairs, okay? And you know what you're paying. You don't have security of tenure, and they can get you out after six months on short, short hold tenancy. But, you know, you could probably find somewhere else to rent. So it's, it is a genuine strategy. If you've got large amounts of money in your home or you've got a large deposit that you were going to put into a home, you might want to think about, does it make sense for me to rent cheaply somewhere because I'm not too sniffy and I'll use the money to buy an investment property. And as long as you've got fixed rate borrowing on the thing, on the property that you're buying, and it's got good tenant demand, and it's in probably my always my view on if you're buying investment property is would I want to live here? You know, would I feel safe walking down the street? And more, more importantly, would I feel safe with my wife walking down the street? Well, I'm not happy to park my car in this area, right? You know, could I see myself going for a walk down to the paper shop? That kind of stuff, right? Just do that smell test if you're going to buy investment property. Um, 
Now another one here is, um, this is new. This month there have been major changes to the ability for you to convert the use of commercial property. And specifically, everything from bookshop bookies um, to um, laundrettes, uh, takeaway food shops, you know, where there might have been a flat above it. You can now convert that all into residential um, under permitted building rights, unless it's in um, a conservation area, then you have the certain sort of criteria. But this is new, okay? This is new. So that basically, the presumption is on that we have the ability to convert um, commercial buildings subject to certain rules into residential. So have a think about that. So when you're thinking about what you're going to do with your money, think, okay, is this something I could do as a joint venture with someone who's done it before? Could I get together with a couple of other people? Um, and could we share up, you know, someone's good at the spreadsheet, someone's good at the project management, someone's good at dealing with the searching for it and researching it. Um, and we can pull resources. So think about that. Um, I've looked at a property, um, I've got a property I've looked at and I'm trying to put a deal together. It was a big shop and it's got a couple of flats above it. And we're looking at probably, you know, converting the shop area under permitted building rights into two or even three flats if it will work. And we're going to put two more floors on the top of it. Okay. Now this is obviously going to cost hundreds of thousands of pounds to do, but think about it on a smaller scale. Is there a local Chinese takeaway that's no longer there or a barber's that's closed down or a florist which is on its last legs? But there might be sandwiched in between houses. So I know I mean, where I live in Ipswich, uh, where I go to my uh, David Lloyd club, it's got one of those thoroughfares and actually there's about four or five houses, then a barber shop, then four or five houses and then there's a um, hairdressers, you know, whatever. So they are there and they could easily be converted back into homes, okay, without too much to do. So think about that. And they are a lot cheaper, those properties, um, those kind of commercial properties that are a bit down at here or, or, or a kebab shop. I mean, who wants to live next to a kebab shop, right? You're doing everyone a favour if you take those things out. So that's called commercial property permitted building rights. So it's, it's permitted building rights and change of use. Okay, it's a bit too complicated for me to explain tonight, but look into it, commercial property that can be converted with offices, shops, retail, industrial, light industrial, can be converted into dwellings. And that is a way, if you're sensible, start small and work with other people who know what they're doing, it's a way of making money. And if you don't wanna do it yourself, just you can find various syndicates around the country that are doing this stuff, but be very careful who you choose and trust, okay? Because property is full of all sorts of characters. But it is something that's new, people are finding their way, and it means that there's a lot more opportunity out there to make money and build income streams. But it doesn't come without effort. It doesn't come without doing research. It doesn't come without some risks and some moving parts. And that may not be for you. Um, another thing here is, uh, just another thing here is, um, Talking to your parents, your grandparents, your aunties, your uncles, um, if they are, you know, they've got a few quid, um, to say to them, just have this conversation. It's a great question is, um, how do you feel about leaving nearly half of your wealth to the Inland Revenue when you die? So I'll say that again. How do you feel about leaving nearly half your wealth to the Inland Revenue when you die? Now that's a great opener, isn't it? I'm not saying go as soon as you walk in the door to see Aunt Bethy, you know, Aunt Bessie or whatever her name is, and say, oh, you know, don't come straight out with that question. But, but ask that question generally, you know, how do you feel, mum, dad, granny and granddad? How do you feel about the inland revenue taking nearly half your money? Because what we're talking about here is that if, you're, if your folks have got, you know, a decent sized house and a few quid in the bank and some investments and perhaps a, perhaps a second property, they could easily have assets of more than a million pounds. And uh, if you've got more than a million pound of assets and it includes property, um, then you're going to pay 40% uh, inheritance tax on the excess. Now, there are ways around that, but one of the simplest ways around it, particularly if they don't need the money, is for them to give it to the next generation or the generation below that. Gift it, right? And if they don't want to gift it, they could lend it to you interest free, okay? And then it can be perhaps wiped off when they die. So that's another way around it. So have a conversation in the family. I'm not saying this is about creating wealth, but it is really, it's about making sure that the family thinks more strategically about the role of money and the role of wealth, rather than people thinking in silos. So I know it's a difficult one sometimes to talk about money, but you know, have that conversation, just raise it like that. You know, are you happy to, to pay nearly 40%, uh, nearly 50% of your money in inheritance tax? Because that's what it is, okay? Now, it might be that they are totally comfortable with that, right? and they don't really care about you. That's fine, that's not a problem, but at least you've had the conversation, and whatever you get is a bonus, okay? But you really don't wanna wait until they're 102 and you're 76, okay? So it'd be better for everyone if, if there's surplus money, if they have surplus money, 
could be put to good use with you. And if you've got a plan for doing wise things with it, for growing it, for looking after it, making it um, help towards the family security and choice, then they're more likely to give you that money. Um, and then obviously the final thing here is just a few other things, um, is um, eliminating waste and leaks. So, you know, we can look for all the ways of making money. And of course you do need to invest in real assets, you know, um, investing index funds, investing property, investing businesses, investing in other people's businesses. Um, you could even do invest by seeders in these little startups, very high risk, but you could back the right one. If you do, don't, again, like crypto, only put small amounts of money into that. And you can invest in small startups. There's one I saw this morning about a guy who's developed this amazing way of storing energy on a, on a thing that turns itself up like, like a coil and then goes backwards. Brilliant idea. But whether he's going to make loads of money, I don't know. But again, you might like that. You might think, well, I'll put 200 quid into that. But every month you might look for something new. So you could build up a small portfolio of startup businesses, knowing that a number of them are going to go bang. But if you've got enough of them and you do it consistently, you know, eventually one or two will come right. OK, and make you good money. And you have fun doing it because you'll be thinking about the social impact. You'll be thinking about the value they're delivering. So that's a good thing to do. But eliminating waste from what you're spending, right? So there was a classic question uh, today on Instagram, which I answered. It said, um, you know, what can I do to sort of plug uh, the spending leaks? And, and obviously the obvious answer is look at your food shopping. Uh, most of us don't um, do our food shopping with any kind of consciousness. Uh, some of us do, but a lot of us, we, we are sort of like ships just meandering along with the wind and the current. And what we've got to do is have a plan. So if you're really trying to to, to wring out more excess money so that you can save, invest, and get rid of debts, etc., and get ahead, then just buy brand non-branded um, food, right? Tins of beans and stuff. Um, my wife bought me a bottle of wine from from a company called B and M. I've never even heard of them. I think she gets the dog food from it. And she says they do wine now. It's fiver. I said, are you sure? Well, I tentatively had a little sip, and it was really nice. So why are we spending nine, ten quid on a bottle of wine when, quite frankly, fiver does the job? Um, call me an old, you know, bit of a philistine, but. Don't tell my friend Steve Caps that. He's a master of wine. He would go absolutely berserk. So, yeah, so here's the thing is, is, you know, buying food in bulk, you know, buying rice and pasta, making up food and putting sections in the freezer with it, okay? Avoiding wasting food. Um, and only, you know, so it's that kind of mindfulness. You can get more out of your existing food budget, but it doesn't mean you've got to live on, you know, horrible stuff. You can eat very well if, you, if you're careful and you're sensible, and that money then can be put to good use. So um, that's just a little run through stuff. If, um, you know, there's just some ideas for you. So let's just have a quick run through on that again. So we talked about salary or bonus sacrifice and getting an employer to have the employer's national insurance. We talked about remortgaging um, to a lower deal if your equity's gone up or your credit rating's improved, in which case you can put the saving possibly into index funds or you could buy some crypto or you could build a deposit for an investment property or you could start a business. We talked about... Um, Having an extra, you could even buy a house with an extra room or create one if you don't already have one, perhaps have an old garage or a side building and, and rent that out under the, the lodger, the rent a room thing, up to seven and a half thousand a year. We talked about um, getting your employer ready to give you a pay rise or bonus, or you're going to have to move your job, aren't you? Uh, I did explain that in a bit more, um, that you need to be subtle about that, you need to be sensible, you need to be sensitive, but you need to make sure that they're aware that it's a tight labour market. Permitted development rights, so you can build up and out without permission. Um, and as long as you do it within the rules, that can add value to your property. You could even make your property such extra value that you could then sell it, move into a smaller one, and possibly be either mortgage-free or reduce your mortgage. Help to build scheme, which is coming out very soon, could actually help you buy a property and avoid that, that silly premium you're paying over the odds for a help to buy a property and actually buy a, build a property that suits you. That's coming out in September. Um, commercial conversions, small shops, industrial units, offices that can be converted to dwellings. You could possibly do that in a, uh, in a joint venture with someone. Uh, possibly rent to invest. Rent out where you're going to live. Rent a place to live uh, and put the money that you either had in your home or you were going to put in a home into an investment property. Yes, there are risks, but look into it. Could actually produce more cash flow so that you actually work is optional. Um, making sure that you have conversations with your family about the role of money and about legacy and about inheritance tax and does it make sense for them to be what I call strategic transfer or even an interest-free loan. Um, so yeah, loads of stuff to eliminate waste, be conscious, be mindful, hope that's been of use to everyone. Um, as I say, tomorrow the podcast is out with a guy who's a crypto obsessive, that's all I can describe him as, uh, well worth looking, uh, interesting bloke. 
Um, and we've got new YouTube content coming out. Um, do check out the Love Island one, see what you think of that, because there's five things you can learn about Love Island. People seem to like that. And um, interestingly, uh, the biggest ever um, reel we've ever had on Instagram has now had nearly 40,000 views. 40,000 views and nearly 1,000 likes. And it's where I also explain, just check it out on Instagram, my profile. It's where I talk about if you were the only person in the world. We'll be doing more of that stuff. We'll be putting more of that content out. So hopefully you can win with money. So look, thanks for being with me tonight. It's not advice. You've got to find your own way, but you can win with money. I know you can. I'll see you next week.